Hello, everybody. I'm Christy Dina, and uh, we're here for World Building Our World. Um, a small content warning. Uh, I will mention uh, very quickly a couple of hate crimes, um, and, but I, I won't be going into any detail, and I'll refer obliquely to projects, um, but I won't be uh, going into details or showing them. So beyond that, uh, hello, and uh, I'll get straight into what I want to share with you because we, I want to make the most of my time here in this talk and the most of my time here on Earth. So straight up, uh, I decided in my teens that it was through creative projects that I wanted to change the world. I did uh, consider law for a bit, um, but it was actually creative practice that was my calling and my choice, and I didn't get into law anyway. Um, so when I look at world building techniques, uh, I'm actually not just looking at how I can create an immersive world um, to see how I can um, transport you just for a few hours to somewhere else. I'm actually uh, looking at these techniques to see if there is a glimpse into how new worlds are actually made. And I have a few questions. Uh, well, that's one of the questions that I'm seeking to answer. Like, how do we actually change the world? Uh, and these are all on my life clipboard. Um, I have a clipboard of questions, virtual clipboard, if you like, of questions that I carry with me throughout my life. Some questions can be answered in a few minutes, some in a few weeks, but most of them uh, take years to be answered. And here are some of the current questions that I'm dealing with. Why is it that I don't find many AAA, AA and Hollywood studios appealing to work in, despite the great talent and the resources that they have there? How can I help others understand or justify why I turn down working with some great clients and companies? Uh, do you really have to make one kind of project for a mass market to hit a mass market? And what other ways can the core essence of a creative project be understood? This is because I also work in transmedia, and so it's like, what is the essence that carries across projects? Do I and others do harm with the projects that we make? Can creative pro projects really change the world? And can I and you change the world now? Well, I actually have one answer for all of these questions. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And in order to do that, I need to go back to 1966, to a book that was published then. The book was uh, written in collaboration with um, two American Austrians, Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman. And the images here are of uh, Peter Berger. And he's spoken about his long-term curiosity with uh, what makes people tick, which is the same with me. I'm interested in that. Um, and in a documentary, he talks about an early memory that he has um, of being given a train, uh, but he didn't turn the electricity on with the train to see it turn around the track. Instead, he lay on his belly and he spoke with the inhabitants of the train and just imagined a whole lot of conversations with them. And it's that curiosity about people that carried him through to actually write this book. A book that other people said that they have seen the world completely differently since reading. And it's a book that, that Peter Berger himself said that he too saw the world differently as soon as the ideas came, came to him, kept, became clear. So what's this book? The book is this, The Social Construction of Reality. Um, it is considered one of the top influential sociological books of all time. Uh, when it was published in 1966, the context was that uh, there was a death of a civil rights activist, Vernon Dahmer, in Mississippi, and a Ku Klux Klan member who was unsuccessfully tried four times for his murder. Uh, Indira Gandhi was elected the first and to date only female Prime Minister of India and the first Winnie the Pooh feature film was released. But in the academic context, uh, this book, uh, which I'll keep referring to as Berger's book as shorthand, 
It contributed to what is known as the sociology of knowledge. Now, previously, all questions about reality were discussed by philosophers right, or economists. It's like, what, what is the nature of things? And what Berger did with this book is it said that actually, uh, what we know about the world is in the minds and the hands of everyone in it. And that maybe we need to look at what passes for common sense knowledge. What are the things that we do every day that actually construct our knowledge, that construct our reality? So very quickly, a definition of reality. Uh, so uh, the way that uh, Berger defines it is reality is a quality appertaining to phenomena that we recognize as being independent of our own volition. Uh, volition. In other words, we can't wish it away, right? It's reality. It's outside of us. And I'm not talking about physics reality. I'm talking about what we yeah, interpret as being reality. So how is it constructed? Um, and so we're going to go into very quickly some of the theories of how they think reality is constructed, uh, but then we're going to get into the juicy stuff, which is um, what this means for our creative projects. So how is reality constructed? Well, first of all, they said that it's co-constructed, that everyone in the human environment creates it. And we do that through our externalizations. Um, every time we externalize our thoughts out into the world. Now. As creatives, you understand, like a lot of you will be familiar with the term externalization because it's used in design to refer to all of the documentation practices we use, for instance. Um, like we've got um, uh, music scores, sketches, storyboards, diagrams, scripts. These are all externalizations of your ideas in a creative project. But externalization uh, is everything that we think and do. It's our everyday conversations, it's our gestures, uh, it's our laws. All of this are our human activities. It's what we do in the world. And what Berger talks about is how over time these activities become habits. And when we repeat them, when we repeat them often enough, they become a pattern, they become a schema in this mind. Uh, this is something that the game designers in the room will be familiar with. That is that rather than remembering every little step and every possible action we could do in each moment, we end up only remembering what we repeated. We don't remember the different ways we could do something, we remember the way we ended up doing it. And that becomes automatic. A musician, for instance, develops muscle memory um, and we you know, greet someone all the time in the same way, but we don't think about you know, what actually they're saying. And this, there is a psychological benefit to this, and that is the narrowing of choice so we don't have to expend cognitive effort. We don't have to think about all those decisions. Our activities become routines, uh, and we create a stable environment in which we do a minimum amount of decision making. Our actions become automatic, and we forget that we had choices. And these habits over time become institutions. Uh, now, you're probably thinking like I did that of institutions as buildings. Uh, but what, from a sociological perspective, when they talk about an institution, they're actually talking about types of actions performed by types of people. Um, employers um, issue work duties and employees execute them. There's the institution of marriage where we have celebrants that marry, marry people, institution of law, institution of family. And importantly, these institutions happen over generations. Um, they only become an institution when they're actually passed on over time but they define who has control uh, and who's allowed to do what to whom. And importantly, a lot of these are transmitted to us through our parents, through the stories that they tell us. Um, in our storybooks, they tell us about the institution of marriage, you know, how girls and boys want to marry and who they can marry. And since, as a child, we had no part in shaping this reality initially, um, it confronts us as a given. Like, we think that it's unalterable, that it's self-evident. Uh, otherwise, it has failed. 
And so all of these parents' stories um, and our films and our games all take shape and is presented as undeniable facts. They're just there, they're external to us, they're persistent all the time. Uh, it takes on an objective nature because it is persistent and echoed everywhere. And we forget we have a choice and we forget that we made it. So we have our externalizations, that we share our inner world, we develop our habits. These habits become unconscious, they become institutions and then we're surrounded by them. And what happens is a process called reification in which we think that what we create is something generated by anything else but ourselves. Over generations, we forget why there were so, um, uh, certain roles that were given, uh, why there was certain social order. Human meanings, Berger explains, are no longer understood as world producing, but as the, just on the nature of things. Our roles um, become something that we don't think we can, can control. Uh, you're a husband, you're a wife, you're a girlfriend, you're a boyfriend, you're an employee, you're a manager. Uh, and it's, in, it's apprehended as inevitable. Uh, and this is when we say things like, oh, I had no choice in the matter. That's my position, that's my role. I had to fire those uncivil people because of that's the logic of economics, of business. Indeed, you can um, assume total identification and um, internalize it. You can basically believe you are the boss, you are the geek, you're, you are meant to be the hot one. The interesting thing is that if these processes are successful, you don't even need to uh, put in uh, extensive rules in place for it to um, be adhered to. This is an example, uh, a famous sporting example. It's Catherine Switzer running in the 1967 Boston Marathon. Um, as Switzer recounts in her memoir, this is a photo of the moment in the race when um, Jock Semple, a race official, came running up behind her and yelled, get the hell out of my race and give me those numbers, and tried to rip off her race numbers. Um, it was then uh, that her boyfriend gave Jock a body blow and pushed him out of the way so Catherine could run. You see, for 70 years, this has been a male-only marathon, but when Switzer and her trainer were entering the competition, they looked through the rule book and found that there were no rules about gender there. Um, they, there was no need to have the rules because everyone just had internalized that, oh yes, women don't run marathons. So when the race um, official saw Catherine challenging this, he exerted his own you know, um, attempt at social control. But last year, Switzerson ran the Boston Marathon again, 50 years after this first run, with the same race numbers, 261. Okay, so we've got the end, the end of this summary. Uh, it's basically, we've got our social construction, we've got the, the ways that we see world, um, the way the world impacts us, and we internalize that, and then we externalize that in our, in our messages and in our projects, and it keeps going around. And this is where the interesting part begins, because Berger talks about these as, as universes and as realities. And in fact, um, from his materials, we can see that there are four key realities or universes that we, as creatives, create in. Uh, so he refers to um, a paramount reality, he refers to reality maintenance, reality, reality metamorphosis, uh, I'm using all of his spelling in the slides, uh, but there's a fourth category that he doesn't really, he uh, uh, implies, but I'll be uh, extending that. These are the four, four ways that we, as creatives, contribute to the realities that exist in the world. So the first one, paramount reality. That's the product of everything that we've been talking about. Um, it's the one par excellence. It's the one that's absolutely everywhere. Uh, and that's why it's called the paramount reality. It's difficult to ignore, and we have to give our attention to it. Um, it's taken for granted as reality. Uh, it's everybody knows that that's what it is. And it is where the majority of all our creative projects are actually made from. Our creative projects are an externalization of what we know. 
And Berger calls the paramount reality a naive one in the sense that we operate in it unconsciously. There is a belief, um, there is uh, one universe, and so we create for it. And this is why we have creatives claiming that their work is neutral or apolitical. Um, they have internalized all the types, all the roles, all the rules about how paramount uh, reality works, and they assume it as just being self-evident, it's objective. And these kinds of projects are produced because the paramount universe is part of the everyday of the creators. It's part of the everyday of the studios. But not everyone who works for the paramount, who creates works for the paramount universe, creates, agrees, sorry, with all the aspects of that universe. I've consulted on projects, um, you know, for these types of. Um, uh, reality, and I have many colleagues around the world who actively challenge paramount reality, such as um, you know what the roles of males and females are, and marriage, uh, race, ability, gender, sexuality. Yet at the same time, uh, and they live unconventional personal lives. Yet at the same time, they make works for the paramount reality. What does this mean, and why? Um, now, Berger does talk about how we can have slight variances in our universe. We can integrate differences uh, into the paramount universe if it doesn't affect our routines. So if we get up, we go to work, we kiss our partner goodbye, uh, we visit family, we do all the things that we normally do every day, then those alternate realities are unproblematic. If your habits remain the same, your routines continue, then paramount reality is unchallenged. So can creative projects that have a paramount reality stance actually do good? We have fun playing these games. Can't we just have fun and why do we have to say something? The problem is that we're always saying something. Uh, if we haven't thought about the impact of the work, then we're producing creative projects that take an uncritical stance. They present reality as if that's just the way it is. Uh, when they're done unconsciously, automatically, when we're using um, these shorthand, oh, sorry, then we're using the shorthand of agreed types, roles, and rules. Uh, for instance, you know, let's play um, with our ability to exert social control by being horrible to people. Uh, let's remind them that there's a right way to be and anything else deserves consequences. Let's treat land as something to be taken and mined to produce and make without ritual or care. It's so easy to create in this reality because it's automatic. We believe we're just using what makes something funny and fun because it's human nature. Comedian Cameron Espos Esposito has commented about the colleagues who have difficulty with integrating um, uh, censorship or the idea of PC culture into their routines. And Cameron basically sort of mimics them and says like, how can I tell jokes? How can I tell jokes without saying all these words? I need these words. And her response is, well, if, if there's any particular word that you need to use to do this job, well then I'm a better stand-up comic than you. The point being that the the reality we create when we don't realize, sorry, it is the reality we create when we don't realize that we can create reality. Works set in a paramount universe don't exhibit qualities of a reality transforming work. Like a roller coaster, we go on the ride, we go around, and then we come back to exactly where we began. There's no transformation that actually happens. All works are always saying something though and works that echo the paramount universe present a world someone else has written, despite what it says in the credits. Can you just make works for fun though? Can you, like do we have to actually try and do something else? Yes, we can, and I'll be talking about that in a moment. But for now, I want to note um, that there are many colleagues uh, who create works, who create films, reality TV shows, books, plays, games, and they create all of these knowing that it's problematic because they need the income. They know on some level they're telling a lie, but they believe that the only way to make money is to, quest, is to make content for the paramount reality, for the status quo. 
And it's true that many of our institutions, our systems are set up for this. But remember the inevitability illusion, paramount reality is not the only reality. There are other realities and markets. So let's have a look. So this was the other reality that Berger spoke about, um, the metamorphosis. And he, he, what he says, he said that um, there is always a haunting presence of metamorphosis, the competing definitions of reality. He talks about other universes that actually increase in their sophistication from that naive mode. And this sophistication, I think, is in part because they involve an awareness of our role in co-creating our reality and techniques, and they embed with them techniques to actually action this. We're taught how to craft games, but not how to shape the world. But as creatives, we can make projects that question and seek to transform paramount reality. The Matrix was about the choice to wake up from the illusion that we're told or choosing to see um, that it is constructed. It's a tale that we see in creative projects throughout time in many forms. People can't engage in challenging paramount reality if they don't first realize that it is constructed. Rod Sterling's The Twilight Zone sought to show the surreal nature of reality, questioning reality and embedding within it tales of hope, along with his production processes so that he, he challenged the status quo of process. It was through TV um, that he believed, that Sterling believed that he could actually have more effect on the world. Another approach is to bear witness to how paramount reality actually affects us in different ways. James Baldwin's essays, first published in The New Yorker in 1962 and then in a book in 1963, involves uh, James addressing his 14-year-old nephew on the 100th uh, anniversary of emancipation. And this is one of the things that he said. He said that every effort made by the child's elders to prepare him for a fate from which they cannot protect him causes him secretly in terror to begin to await without knowing that he is doing so his mysterious and sorry beginning to wait without knowing that he is doing so his mysterious uh, punishment he must be good not only in order to please his parents and not only to avoid being punished by them Behind their authority stands another, nameless and impersonal, infinitely harder to please and bottomly, bottomlessly cruel. And this filters into the child's consciousness through his parents' tone of voice as he is being exhorted, punished and loved. In the sudden, uncontrollable note of fear heard in his mother's or his father's voice when he is strayed beyond some particular boundary. He does not know what that boundary is and he can get no explanation for it, which is frightening enough. But the fear he hears in the voices of his elders is more frightening still. The fear that I heard in my father's voice, for example, when he realized that I really believed I could do anything a white boy could do and had every intention of proving it, was not like the fear I heard when one of us was ill or had fallen down the stairs or stayed too far from, house, from the house. It was another fear, a fear that the child in challenging the white world's assumptions was putting himself in the path of destruction. His bearing witness is passed on to make it clear what we carry with us and our duty to keep challenging things. More recently, Jordan Peele's feature film documents the horror of race relations and topped box offices, uh, the box office records with a black lead, something that the rules of society, of reality, has said was not possible. And interestingly, Jordan is, uh, will be hosting the next Twilight Zone reboot. We have it in our music across the generations. Gil Scott Heron's 1970 spoken word jazz track, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, reminds us that change is in our hands. The lyrics include, the revolution will put you in the driver's seat. The revolution will be live. The African uh, American spiritual song, Ain't, ain't gonna net, let nobody turn me round, has the lyrics of keeping on walking, keeping on talking and march, marching to freedom land. Midnight Oils, 
beds are burning is a call to act. Um, how can you sleep while your beds are burning? And in the documentary just released called uh, 1984 Midnight Oil, uh, there is old fit footage of the lead singer Peter Garrett addressing a school. And he says, I don't think politics means that you're old enough to vote. I think politics means the understanding that you can change the way society affects you. We see it in Beyonce's formation, a powerful collection of scenes and moves of empowerment with the lyrics, I dream it, I work hard, I grind it, I own it. It's a capitalist dream, but it is a form of power. Childish Gambino's uh, This Is America takes aim straight at racism throughout time and present in America. Uh, Amanda Palmer's recent music video, Mr. Weinstein, Weinstein Will See You Now, includes the end, the end sentiment that you can write your story. And we see it in the comedy of Bill Hicks and now Hannah Gadsby. Gadsby makes it clear that there is a personal cost to producing content for a Paramount universe. Gadsby had to be willing to give it all away to take on her reality. What Gadsby discovered was that there is actually a market for different realities. It, does, it requires using a different narrative and interaction structures though. Most of our rules of creative practice are rules that work for the status quo, not for those wanting to transform. For all the talking games about having agency, most games do not encourage you to have agency in your own world. But let's look at ones that do. An early example is Chris Crawford's Balance of Power, which he made using his severance uh, from a company that he was actually laid off from. It is set in the Cold War, and it's a criticism of the structures, structures that support war and, and, um, and power and the use of nuclear power. Crawford said that it was Bob Dylan's song, Blowing, Blowing in the Wind, that was an influence on him making this game, trying to promote peace. Gonzalez Frasca's uh, game, September the 12th, puts you in the position of killing terrorists, only to find killing does not actually reduce the number of terrorists, it increases them. The New York Times describes September the 12th as an op-ed composed not of words, but of actions. Molay Industrious games are all designed for culture jamming. A popular example is Unmanned, which is a critique of drone warfare and masculinity, and the, one, the masculinity that's associated with war. In 2003, Papers, Please um, gives us moral decisions as an immigration officer around supporting our own family and being humane to others. It is in some ways documenting the tensions of working in paramount reality for the sake of income. It was a critical and commercial success. Within three years of release, it was, this was back in 2016, it had sold over 1.8 million units and won numerous awards. Here's your fucking papers, switches the perspective to the person trying um, to actually get over the border and highlights the difficulties one faces with changing bureaucracies. Proceeds of the game were going to organizations that assisted people uh, in immigration. That game was made at GamerX GX Dev. Indeed, there are lots of jams that operate around the world that facilitate games for reality transformation. The Resist Jam has tons of resistant games made by creators from around the world, including a Papers, Please version set in Canada. And Anthropy's Dysphoria is an autobiographical game that actually opened up the personal game area for many and is described by Nick Fortungo, the designer of Dino Dash, as the most powerful translation of the experience of gender reassignment in any medium ever. This game was available for free for a while, then paid, and now is free again. Night in the Woods, an adventure game that through a storyline of allegor allegorical characters who um, experience um, mental health issues. And it's based on the developer's own personal experiences. It's available on desktop, tablet, mobile, PlayStation, Xbox, and Switch. It's won multiple awards and has been listed as one of the top games of 2017. It's had critical and commercial success. In Berger's book, therapy is listed as one of the social control mechanisms to try in the past to try and get people to return to reality. Um, but we now have therapists that can not try and do that anymore if you find the right one, and that's something that the developers recommend. Here is uh, 
Example here, Tilt Factors Buffalo, card game, the party game for adults. Your aim is to collect as many cards as possible by quickly name dropping a response to the blue and orange cards that are there. What you won't see on the box or on any descriptions in any of the stores is actually what the game was really designed to do. It was uh, commissioned by the National Science Foundation to help reveal to people their unconscious biases. The developers intentionally did not tell anyone about it and wanted it to be an emergent experience that happened, and they called it a stealth approach. So I want to highlight here the market for these kinds of projects, and many of these works have had an ongoing resonance for many years. They are, they are standout hits, both critically and commercially. There are some works that are not sold, they're just offered for free, um, and the artists gather income from other sources. And of course, the wild successes are due to them being well written and designed, uh, and they have a message and a transforming effect. There's great skill involved in this approach. Um, that, yeah, and one point I want to highlight here too is that the player or, and the audience desire for these types of experiences. I see some serious games aimed at people who aren't interested in changing. For instance, a racist person isn't interested in picking up a game about racial discrimination. And that is why some projects are about being a great entertainment or art piece in themselves that operate with stealth. But an underutilized market is people interested in self-transformation. Rather than aiming your creative works at people who you want to change, instead, you're creating works for people who consciously want to change something about themselves. Some of us don't need a wizard to come to our door knocking before we become a better person. And this is a market that I'm aiming for, one that relates to our last category. But before we get there, I need to talk about the pushback to these reality transformations. Reality, reality maintenance. This occurs when there are problems with the Paramount universe. It occurs when socialization from one generation to the next hasn't been successful. When the kids say, I don't understand why these two people can't marry. Um, it also happens when there are conflicting universes and each of these universes have developed their own ways of maintaining their realities. There becomes a viable alternative. And there are different methods that are used to push back to get us back to paramount reality, which is considered the best reality. Legitimization is one technique. Um, it's basically the process of explaining and justifying why we do things. The example of the parent uh, speaking to the kid, um, the issue there is that we don't know why these rules were put into place. And so legitimization is the thing that continuously reminds us why we are doing these things. Fame is something that's passed in from generation to generation, fame, celebrity. Um, it's uh, transformed to keep being relevant in some way. You can get famous, you can get a husband or a wife, you can have kids and you can keep being in the public eye, you can afford assistants and nannies, you can have a family and be famous and run your own company. Fame gives you independence. All of these justifications for continuing that same social order. Every generation has justifications for war throughout all the art forms, film, TV, novels, games. It has to be continually repeated over and over why we do war. Our reality TV shows um, about border security, which I notice you have the Australian one on Swedish TV, uh, those police reality TV shows, the SWAT um, TV shows, all of these aim to legitimise paramount reality, the rules, the types, and the social consequences of deviating. Um, content warning, Trump. Uh, and so, uh, Trump's make America great again, right? An important aspect of the language uh, of the universe maintenance is about returning to a reality, a reality that is framed as being paramount, as logical, as better. It's not about moving forward or transforming what we know, it's about returning to what was known before. The claim is that the discomfort anyone feels is not because of paramount reality, it's because we've deviated from paramount reality. 
There are games that seek to ex exert overt control um, through showing the consequences of deviating. These games um, I'm not showing. Uh, they involve mass murder, rape, and other crimes against humanity. Uh, and I've chosen not to show them because their existence, their words, help shape reality. Unfortunately, there is the belief that hearing out people's thoughts has no power. I think people believe that power it rests with lawmakers or something, but as Berger has shown, it's in the everyday conversations, it's everything that we make that actually transformation occurs. So when journalists claim to be objective in their reporting, they're forgetting that words are not benign, they're actually incantations. Okay. I put this here because I've actually worked on a project that was for reality maintenance. Uh, it was about a decade ago. Uh, it, was a, it was an app that was funded by Screen Australia and it won a Australian Directors Award, Guild Award. And I worked on it, as I said, 10 years ago when it was in the concept development stage. And it's a pickup artist game, right? It's a, it's a game about you know, treating women as objects and, you know, objects to be manipulated into, into sex. Uh, and at the time, I just thought, oh, they're just, you know, naive and, and don't know what they're doing. And then uh, when I saw their posts in social media and everything, I realised it was a slow realisation of like, oh, no, this is actually serious intent behind this. My point in mentioning that is that, you know, you may be working on projects that are in this reality um, and, you know, I'm hoping to show with these alternatives that you don't necessarily have to be, uh, you can choose not to. And so we'll now go into the last category. We've got the paramount reality, we've got reality transformation, so trying to change it. We've got maintenance, so trying to bring us back. And then the fourth option here is reality creation. And the difference here is that rather than aiming your creations towards maintaining or changing, your focus shifts to co-creating something completely new. And in order to do this, your focus involves looking deeply within yourself. You look into the melting pot and you face yourself. Let me explain this further. Years ago, I was developing an interactive comedy about the meaning of death. Uh, it was after my mum's uh, sudden passing of a uh, brain aneurysm and I was channeling all my grief into this creative project. I was working on the dialogue and I was having a really hard time trying to get it right. I wanted to have it, uh, ha wanted it to have the same wit and insight that I find Sorkin's dialogue from West Wing has. And I know there's, you know, problems with um, Sorkin's worldview as well, but that sort of dialogue of that, that wit um, I wanted to have in mind. And I just was not getting it right. And it wasn't just because dialogue is hard. On top of that, it was something more. It's, I wanted, um, it's because I had not been living that kind of life. I was not practiced in actually speaking my mind, let alone speaking my mind with eloquence. Now, some may be thinking, well, that's what writers do. You make stuff up stuff up. Sure, we make stuff up. Uh, we have settings, characters, objects, plots, everything that comes, but all of this comes from somewhere. If you're writing characters you don't know about, then you're either drawing on cliche or you're drawing on yourself. This is why we have so many strong women characters that don't quite ring true. They're not written from a point of view of a personal experience of strength. And I wanted to write dialogue that represents how I experience strength. And I was not able to at that point. So funnily enough, I actually decided to start working on my everyday life in order to make better projects. But the point is that your creative project can only stretch the imagination as far as you have personally stretched your inner world. I'm going to refer to a brand here. Um, it's a brand called Hester. It's a superannuation company in Australia. Their aim is to make real differences to the lives of our members and also to women in Australia. Uh, women have less superannuation than men, but they live longer. Um, the things that I wish to highlight here is that this value, this goal of the company is only possible because they have been doing a lot of work internally in the culture of the company. The company is living this and breathing this. 
So there are many brands out there, many companies that ring the woke bell, if you like, um, but don't live it in the everyday. The things that you create in the world are definitely a reflection of how you personally live the world. The Wachowskis, uh, they created a world where there's polyamorous lifestyles and different roles and types and our different sense of a space and time. None of this could have been conceived or created without the massive internal work that the Wachowskis did. These projects are externalizations of an internal reality. Rebecca Sugar's Steven Universe is producing characters and plots that make new, um, new types and roles normal in that world because of the reality stance of the creators. John Lennon's Imagine asks us to imagine the world we want and to actually feel it. And more recently, this music video was just released uh, and with the lyrics, I'm not a boy, I'm not a girl, I'm fractal. It depicts an environment with lots of people enjoying their own fractal reality, a celebration of just being. Journey. Journey is a world where the journey of your life is, is in doing the internal work and then turning back to reach others and help them on their journey. It was a commercial and critical success. David O'Reilly's Everything. You begin as a bear and you can move through your consciousness to that of a horse, a flower, a blade of grass, and it's got the edited recordings of the philosopher Alan Watts reading over it. Polygon described it as the most true to my life game I've ever played, and the Washington Post described it as a rare game that may push you to want to lead a better life. Mr. Rogers' Neighbourhood had the same effect on people. The TV series had people lining up around the streets to meet Fred, who was about kindness. The doco on the series premiered at the 2008 Sundance Film Festival. It received acclaim from critics, and at the time of writing this, has grossed over $22 million, making it the highest grossing biographical documentary of all time. The next documentary is gonna be starring Tom Hanks. An important moment from the original series was when Mr. Rogers invited Officer Clemens to join him in the cooling pool. Now this is in the context of segregation happening at the time where African Americans were not allowed to swim in the same pool as white Americans. So universe creation can be these simple moments. This is where you can just create something that's just fun and just is, but it is the result of the internal work that you've done. You can just make, you can just be, when you choose to create the way you want to be. And finally, the studio True Love, headed by ex-lead of AI programmer, AI programmer for three Assassin's Creed games and Child of Light, Brie Code, um, the studio is described by Slate as a studio devoted to radically different framework uh, built on care and connectivity. It was an experiment that the creators uh, ended up having a rousing success. It reached over 500,000 downloads within six weeks. And in this experience, you spend a lot of time in bed, tending to your plants, reading tarot. It's a new everyday, an everyday that's been ex externalized from the everyday of the developers. It's from their new inner work. And it's these kind of projects that these kind of categories that I would love to see up there on Netflix or in PlayStation, where I can actually flick through and decide, I actually feel like a transformation reality right now. I feel like a new reality, as opposed to trying to search for all of those there. And so we have our questions. Why, why is it that I don't find many of these studios appealing? It's because the majority of them create paramount reality. The same with that next question. That's why I've turned down many big projects. Uh, do you really have to make um, one kind of project for a mass market? No, not at all. These markets, these realities are getting bigger and bigger. And is there other ways that you can create a core essence um, of a creative project? Yes. When I'm working on transmedia projects, I look at what the reality stance of their project is. Do I and others um, do harm with the projects that we create? Yes, yes we can. Um, can creative projects really change the world and can we? Yes. Yes we can and that was the motto of 
the transformation reality of uh, Barack, Barack Obama. And so that is where I'm going to end with answering all those questions, hopefully, in that 45 minutes. Thank you for your time. I welcome any questions or thoughts you may have, or we can chat afterwards. Give it a couple of moments in case someone's thinking. That's cool. I'm going to make sure I'm out there afterwards if there's not going to be any hands. So what's the, what's the first step you take in creating uh, one of these new projects to change the world? Say it again, sorry. Uh, the first step you take in choosing to create one of these projects. The what's, first step. What's, yeah, what's your, what's your baseline to get started on that? Yeah, so uh, for me it's a case of, um, for me when I look at through all the projects that I have been making and the projects that I am making now they fall into the transformation and the creation categories um, when it comes to creation I'm basically intending just to have just to create something that's uh, fun and interesting but it's not um, it's it's not perpetuating anything that I you know I don't like or I feel that does harm uh, and so, yeah, for me, the projects always come from a, an insight that I've had about the world. Um, so I'm, I'm developing, for instance, a short animated film that goes with a companion uh, local co-op um, game at the moment. And with that, uh, that is a exploration of a different kind of friendship. Um, like, what could friendship mean if it isn't about uh, just making each other feel good? What if friendship was about how we can actually uh, confront the parts ourselves that we don't really like? Uh, so, yeah, I take inspiration from the things that I have discovered and then see where I can go from there uh, and check them from other people. But I research as much as I can the stru existing structures that are there, so the you know, game genres, uh, narrative genres that are out there, and then I compare that against the structures of transformational learning. So there are structures on how people are transformed, and so I re-graphed the progression of, you know, of the player and the experience um, according to facilitating a transformation. So I hope that helps. That's some, some insight there. Yep, cool. Yep. Uh, hi. So I'm, I'm having a bit of trouble sort of um, thinking how I should... Uh, present my question because I'm uh, it, it's like because you talk about um, like changing the world for good with what the, the kind of media that you create um, but what I'm considering is like how you create that like how do you leverage doing good by say using exploitative me measures like um, you know keeping people's data and using that to sort of in ways that might do good, but the fact that you're sort of without their consent um, gathering data about them, like that is in itself something that we take for granted and that might not be good. Um, and so I guess my question is, you know, can you do good with bad? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> or like definitely. How, how do you leverage that? You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, yes, definitely. And I, what's for, I find, I, I th yeah, can you do good with bad? I think, can you do bad with good? Like that was the basis of the question. Just making sure I'm hearing that right. Yep. Uh, yes, you can, definitely. And there is a lot of checks that are out now um, about how you can audit your work to see what the, um, the effect that you're having. And there are checks that are happening in the IT sector, in the UX sector, um, lots of lots of other places um, and I've been using those as I come um, for instance the no regret test and the no regret test is if the user if the player knew the techniques 
that you were using to get them to think and feel certain things? Would they still feel good about doing your, your work? Right? Um, the no regret test, like if they're aware of it. Uh, and so, and you know, that helps with like, okay, is this only dark manipulation and, uh, and all of that? So yeah, it's about being aware of those processes and, and those, those tests and those, those things that I keep looking at that are happening in lots of different areas. Um, to, to help go against that. And you can get consultants um, to check as well, uh, uh, which I will be using on my projects once they get to the next stage, is putting them in front of other people and saying, what do you see? Uh, and then, of course, you know, we're not perfect. And so how do you change out of that? You know, what will you do with your next project and how will you handle criticism and uh, reduce and minimise the harm that you have done? Yeah, you know, being, uh, being open and honest about that. I think there was one there. Um, can you hear me? Yes. OK. So I'm wondering if there is a way or if it's even possible to create projects that change the world radically without giving some sort of uh, painful personal sacrifice. Um, do you understand what I'm going with? <laughs> is there a way to change the world that does involve sacrifice or doesn't? Without giving your personal, you know, blood and stuff. <laughs> to oh, do you mean as in... Um, as in personal sacrifice. You know, you make this project that is kind of um, painful to create or means a lot to you and it kind of goes in the world and the feedback you're getting is, you know, it's a backlash. Oh. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm oh, sure the backlash that you, that you might get from projects? Yeah. Is that, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there's a couple of things there. One, uh, the more and more projects that I've done, the more and more important I found it is to enjoy the process of making more than the outcome of the making. Um, just because I don't have complete control over what the outcome will be. I do my work as best as I can. Um, you know, I do my testing, you know. Um, I, I do all of that to check how it's affecting people. Uh, but in the end, I have no control how, how what happens. And so I, I need to enjoy the process and get a lot from it. And I do that by taking care of myself during the process of making and allowing myself to actually be changed by the project while I am making it as well. Um, I'm transformed in every project because I'm figuring out, well, how, how what, you know, what is friendship? You know, and, and it changes my relationships with people um, with that. So that's, that's one way, like if you, if you overemphasize how the outcome, the con you know, the effect on other people, um, then you will be, you know, a reed in the wind, like always at the whim of what other people are, are thinking and feeling. Um, so you've got to strengthen yourself first before it goes out. Um, in uh, in terms of yeah, response um, and reaction out there, it, you know, there are technical things you can do in terms of. Um, uh, making sure you're not hacked and things like that uh, in terms of two-factor authentication and everything. Thankfully, I haven't had any issues like that at, at this point. Um, uh, but, um, but as I said, yeah, I think the, the, the best thing that you can do is, is do it for yourself first. Um. Hi. Hello. Um, let's see. How, do you have any tips on how I can differ or stray from the paramount reality, but specifically for art and graphics? Oh, gr yes. Um, how do you avoid paramount reality with graphics, with visuals? Yeah. Okay. Yes, um, I'm, I'm more on the writing design side, but I'm also director of my projects, which means I'm working with artists and audios and programmer all the time. And uh, th these uh, figures, for instance, are intentionally um, not um, 
male or female, they're not gendered, you know. Um, and, you know, those, those are some of the things that we sort of do is, is, is just play with those sorts of visuals. There's shorthand in terms of silhouettes, like in, in games how silhouettes are really important as a way to quickly communicate some things. But those silhouettes can easily go into stereotype and cliche. Uh, and so it's about, you know, checking checking those elements to sort of see, well, maybe the silhouettes can evoke more positive associations that aren't stereotypical. Uh, and so, yeah, just not, not drawing on the things that re repeat those unconscious expectations and those, those, those stereotypes. Um, but there is some great material out there, uh, lots of different ways that artists, you know, work around those things. So, uh, yeah, there are resources that you can draw on. But that's just a couple of examples. Yep. Cool. Great. I think we'll end there so the next person has time to set up. Thank you for your time here today. Thank you.